In terms of concussions and protocols, how important is the nutrition towards that? Huge. I think that it's always a missed piece. And luckily here, it's so ingrained in how mm. we manage. And so the kind of the way that we are doing things now is we've honestly taken the, the C word out of things. We've taken concussion out of things and been like, hey, you had a tough bout mm. and any person with a tough bout, right? There's going to be impact to your brain, to your nervous system. This is why you should care, right? It's going to increase risk of injury. You're going to feel off. You could be emotional. Like this could impact your life in general. So we've moved kind of toward this like brain health initiative right after 24 hours, chill, get off your phone, get off of the TV. Don't go hang out with people. Don't drink alcohol, which is really hard after a fight, especially if you have won. Yeah. Um, but that's going to really perpetuate that high inflammatory state. And it's just, it's not helpful for healing in general. So first 24 hours, keep it chill. Um, don't aggravate symptoms. We're not trying to train or push into anything. So this is not a paid ad, but I wanted to give first beat a big thank you for sending me one of their heart rate monitors to test and get my thoughts on it. First Beat is a heart rate monitor that helps coaches track their athletes' performance throughout their sessions. With First Beat's platform, you are able to get a detailed analysis on every session and how that impacted your athletes' internal and external loads. It looks at aerobic performance, anaerobic performance, different measure that you can possibly think with your heart rate. At the end of each session, both athlete and coach gets a detailed report sent directly to their emails, which makes it easier to have those conversations around how that session went and the intensities that you're able to achieve throughout it. If you would like a detailed review on First Beat Heart Monitor, comment a heart emoji on the comments and head over to my social media and do the same for the latest Instagram post. Hello and welcome back to PA Chalk App. Today, we have a special guest. Hi, Olivia. How are we doing? <laughs> good. How are you, Manny? I'm good. Obviously, we can see from behind you that you also work with the USC. So if you just tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got to where you are. Yeah. So my name is Olivia Abdu and just wanted to take a second and say thanks again for having me on. Um, so I'm a physical therapist here at the UFC Performance Institute based out of Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, so I'm originally from Southern California. I grew up in Long Beach. I went to PT school at Cal State Long Beach, uh, which is three-year program after undergrad. I went to undergraduate school in LA as well. And then following PT school, I took a unique path and I went and completed a sports residency program at Duke University in North Carolina. And so what a sports residency program looks like is you're a full PT at that point, you're licensed and all that, but you're taking a year to specialize in, there's a bunch of different specialties like orthopedics, um, women's health, geriatrics, it goes on, but I specifically did mine in sports. And so the reason I did that uh, was I always grew up playing sports. I love sports. I knew that's kind of the path that I wanted to go down, but in physical therapy school, um, it's not required for you for PT schools to teach you anything about sports. I luckily got one course where I went, um, but during my um, clinical rotations, I had some awesome instructors that worked with Premier Lacrosse League players um, and other athletes as well. And so that really pushed me down to getting this really specific clinical training and experience. And so when I was at Duke, I primarily worked with high schools in the area, which was totally awesome. I got really great experience working with athletic trainers, um, dealing with acute injury management, sideline management, practice and game coverage. Um, really unique to physical therapist versus, let's say, an athletic trainer. Um, so for me, it made a lot of sense to go down that path because I initially wanted to do athletic training, but the way that things are moving here in the U.S. is you have to get a master's degree in athletic training, which is two years mm. after P, uh, after like undergraduate, and then PT school is three years. So sports in general, especially at the professional level, look for people who are dual credentialed, so PTATs. Mm. 
but that honestly is a dying breed at this point because financially it doesn't make sense to go to athletic training school and to PT school. Um, financially, it's not really feasible to do either of those things, right? But um, so for me, and that's what what those sports residencies were kind of created for was to give physical therapists an opportunity to gain those experiences. Um, and there I got a lot of one-on-one mentorship um, mm. on how to rehab athletes, doing return to play protocols. Um, so it was a really great experience. And while I was there, I worked um, a little bit in the Duke athletic training room. Um, and there I was really exposed to our sports scientists, strength and conditioning coaches, um, other athletic trainers across all sports. Um, I primarily worked with the women's volleyball team kind of outside my residency experience because uh, I grew up playing volleyball. That's kind of my my first and true love there. Being 5'2", it was never going to last for me, but um, I just live vicariously through my athletes at this point. Um, but while I was there, just seeing that interdisciplinary collaboration at an incredibly high level at mm. the Division One level made me realize, like, nah, this is really where I want to be. Like, I love my high school athletes. Like, covering high school wrestling tournaments, my favorite, absolutely. Um, but being at that higher level, that's where I wanted to be. And so following residency, I actually went and did a fellowship. So I did a Division One physical therapy sports fellowship. And so – This is similar to sports residency. It's usually about a one-year program. Um, You do get paid for it. You get paid pretty shitty, but you get paid. You get a lot (laughs) of experience. Like a GA position. Exactly. It's it's very similar to that, and and it's trying to give you that experience of the grind of sports for sure. Mm. But really, um, and so just to kind of rewind, like physical therapists don't have to do a residency program. They don't have to do a fellowship to be PTs, to be sports PTs, to get into any of these fields. But for me, I wanted that clinical experience, that mentorship to really push me much quicker um, as a clinician, just that development and to get me where I wanted to be. And so in the fellowship at the time, there's probably like four or five fellowships in the U S it's all just one person per fellowship. Um, now it's slowly growing. Um, But I went to Wake Forest University to complete that fellowship. So I stayed in North Carolina for a year. And there I was with the football team, every practice, traveled for every game, taping at 445 in the morning, Mm. um, and then working in the training room, working with uh, Division One collegiate athletes. And then I also worked in a sports clinic outside of that. Um, So how I explain it is residency makes you like a, you should be a, be able to treat athletes. It makes you a sports certified specialist. You're supposed to take the test at the end, get your letters, you know, at the end of your name and stuff. But fellowship is how do I interact and collaborate and contribute to a high level interdisciplinary complex environment, um, which is what I wanted ultimately. So working with physicians on top of your athletic trainers, strength and conditioning sport, uh, Uh, strength and conditioning coaches, your sports scientists, your nutritionists, your dietitians, your sports psych, uh, academics, right, and collegiate. I mean, that was huge, especially when we dive into, uh, you know, more concussion stuff. But Mm. that was really the goal of fellowship was to be able to do that. And I got incredible experience, great mentorship there, really set me up. But while I was there, I kind of reflected and realized, you know, I've done every step in my career has been harder and more outside my comfort zone and a higher Mm. level. So to me, it made sense to try and get into the pro setting because I'd never been in it. So how would I know if I liked it or not? So um, because the fellowship was coming to an end, it's only a year I had to find a job. And to be honest, it's not like the, the greatest like sports getting in like story that you hear, right. You're supposed Mm. to know somebody, you have this network and all this stuff, which I did, but honestly, I just applied on, it was either um, LinkedIn or on Teamworks or something. And then, yeah, they flew me out, did an interview, one of the hardest interviews I've ever done, but it was exactly (laughs) what you wanted in an interview. Um, and yeah, and then here we are not, you know, when I say outside of my comfort level, being in one professional sports already outside of that, and then being mm. working with professional MMA athletes, which I had never watched a UFC fight before. Everybody hates when I tell them that too, right? I knew nothing <laughs> about the sport really. 
I, I had treated some jujitsu athletes, some pro wrestlers, um, but nothing to this extent. And people always ask like, oh, like how'd it feel going into a sport you've never worked with before? And I'm like, honestly, it's all the same. One, I, everybody's the same to me. I don't know mm -hmm. who's famous. I don't know who is who. So I treat everybody the same, which I think was a huge perk um, and a huge benefit for me. But ultimately the fundamentals, right? Just like with strength and conditioning or performance or anything, the fundamentals are all the same, yeah. right? Like I need to be able to treat the 90 year old granny who's had 20 years of low back pain, right? Like regardless of who I'm going to deal with next. Now, as we start getting into more sports specific things, sure. But I always utilize my athletes, right? Like they, they know their sport the best. They know their bodies mm -hmm. the best. So I always incorporate them in creating drills, creating treatment plans and things like that. So like really the transition wasn't hard because my background set me up to be as successful as possible in this even higher level interdisciplinary, you know, pretty much like ecosystem that we have here. Yeah. So, sorry, that was long. No, 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 no. But... So, <laughs> there's, there's, there's a lot to unpack there. And I kind of want yeah. to get to some of the like basic, really mm -hmm. early start. And it's something that I truly, truly believe in. It's experience over a piece of paper. And like, obviously going through all the division one programs, all the different high school teams. Now you're at, it is the best MMA sort of organization in the world. Like how did one experience sort of follow each other and how did that prepare you to, to be where you are just now? Yeah. So I think from a, a, like a sports lens, because I get this, there's, I get this question a lot because there's a lot of different types of residencies out there. Mm -hmm. There's some that are very high school based, like I went to, and there's some that are very collegiate, like high level um, residencies as well. But for me, starting at that high school level was the best thing I could have done because those athletic trainers, those coaches, they want, they need help. They need all the help they can get. They are spread so thin. So it gave me true hands-on experience. So like for me, the high school I covered, the JV team was my team. I ran onto the field. I talked to coaches. I called parents. I did everything from start to finish with them. Mm. But if I'm trying to learn and gain experience at a really high level right off the bat, like in college, they have athletic trainers for that. They don't need me to do any of that. That's not really my role or place. So I think like from the start, getting experience and, and really understanding what those athletic trainers are doing, what those strength and conditioning coaches are doing on the ground level, kind of like maybe at that like high school, whatever, could be anything mm -hmm. um, where you can really get your hands dirty. Like that's the key, right? Is like, you don't know what you're going to do when you see a broken leg until it happens, right? But if you're in a position where you're kind of stuck in a corner or siloed off, like you're never going to be able to actually do that. Or things like growing up being an athlete and working with strength and conditioning coaches. And I always remember talking with them, like, how did you program this? Why are we going this way? Uh, versus whatever, like, why are we doing this specific lift in this specific way? Um, and that's the kind of hands-on experience that you want. And I think that's why a lot of like, you know, people in sports grew up playing sports, yeah. right? Like it gives you that experience and that exposure. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, like that's kind of where it started was like just getting your hands dirty. And even in PT school, when it was COVID and I couldn't get sports experience, right? I'm trying to build up a resume to apply for residency and there's nothing. I just reached out to an athletic trainer at on campus and I just would go to their labs. Like I would just go to their classes and getting that kind of experience, right? So that's kind of where it started. And ultimately my goal was always to like, just build confidence as a clinician. Like I honestly just wanted to be able to talk in a way that didn't sound dumb or rambling, you know, to be clear and concise. Right. And like, when you first get out there, you're like, first off, who's letting me be a physical therapist? This is insane. Um, but then you just want to come off as confident and that helps you get by and right off the bat. And that can be, you know, for any profession that we're working with, especially now at this higher level with, I mean, I'm working with adults, even though half the time they act like kids, right? <laughs> but being able to walk into a room and be like, all right, we're doing this, this, and this, this is the plan moving forward. And this is why, 
I've gotten a lot of athletes who've asked me if I'm from the East Coast because I come off really assertive and I find mm. that a compliment since I have family in New York and New Jersey. So, um, yeah. So that's kind of where I started and, and why I found that like so pivotal in getting me to where I am now. Because, I mean, I do all that acute injury stuff now. We cover fights on the sports med side. Um, so we all – so the way that our clinic is set up is um, – at the PI in Vegas, we treat one-on-one -on -one every hour, um, usually just like a general eight to five if it's not a fight week. And then um, we rotate through who covers the fights. So mm -hmm. I'll travel domestically and globally, um, which is really awesome. And so we'll kind of treat throughout the week if we're traveling, and then we will cover the fight um, that Saturday night, including yeah. the fights that are here in Vegas. And so yeah. we provide that medical coverage in the back where we are splinting. Um, we are doing wound care. We're fitting crutches, boots, a lot of education on how do you take care of this injury? You know, what needs to happen next? And then kind of collaborating with our physicians uh, to make sure that they have a good continuation of care afterward. Yeah. You were just at a uh, Miami car, weren't you? Yes. Yeah. That was some card. Yes. We were yeah. busy. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Especially towards that later fight cards where the main events were obviously quite stacked with injuries as well mm -hmm. yes it's always always interesting i see something new every time and that i mean honestly being here i see something new every day that keeps you on your toes uh which is the best part right i i ultimately my long-term goal was i don't want to deal with insurance and mm. i want to go somewhere where i can work in t-shirts and sweats and I can't be in the same place the whole day. Yeah. Those were my three kind of requirements long term. And so we've we've checked all those boxes here. My dad hates it when I say this. Uh, so like I'm the exact same as you. As long as I'm in sweats, shorts, t-shirt, or a hoodie, like I am golden. Like I am perfect. Right. But my dad's a little bit more old school Portuguese where he's always like dressed to the nines. Like he's always got like a, a vest or a suit on. And I'm just like, look, I picked the job that I'm in just so I could wear shorts and do these. Right. He hates it. But like at the same time it's like it's comfortable. Like who doesn't love being comfortable at work? Well you're moving around and you're doing all this stuff. We're on our feet all the time. Like I don't want to have to squat down in khakis, you know? Mm. Like it's just so silly. So hundred percent. Back to an earlier point that you had is like I once had this lecturer say to me, like we're obviously in this course because at some point along our ways we've had a really good experience with sport or a coach or a trainer or a teacher that has led us to, to have such a good experience that we're here. So it's that thing of always wanting to be that good experience for someone else as well. Is that mm -hmm. something that you've sort of found along your ways? Absolutely. I mean, I have a laundry list of mentors and people who have really influenced and affected my life you know, personally and professionally. Um, and I think like that is something I always try and do is to give back. So I mm -hmm. will, any, any student, any person that reaches out to me on LinkedIn or DMs me on Instagram, I always give them my phone number and always work to set up a phone call with them. Like no matter I what. Can for that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, because like those little conversations like mattered so much yeah. to me and if I could just help and say one little thing, like I just recently talked with a, she's a kinesiology student in Canada and she's doing a dissertation, like she's doing a thesis or a dissertation on being a, like working as a woman in sports, mm -hmm. which is a big passion and advocacy thing of mine. And just to just give her some things and her feedback of like, I had no idea where this conversation was going to go, but you have like, impacted me so much and i just appreciate that just to get get that back like means mm -hmm. so much because i think of all the people that did that for me yeah because i definitely wouldn't be where i am without those individuals for sure i've got a couple of articles that you might be interested in reading so at the university i was at one of the lecturers there she's sociology but she does a lot of kind of snc related to women and how women are perceived in the industry so she breaks down like the the whole male orientated industry and how that impacts female uh, female coaches and 
it's a really interesting i'll link it down below as well because it's it's a good read yeah absolutely i mean it's been it's it's such a big topic of conversation now i mean and it always should have been right but now we're really getting some good limelight but i think like people ask me oh have you dealt with you know d- X, whatever y, yeah X, Y, and Z as you've gone through this. And I'm like, yeah, of course. Like I've been looked over for plenty of jobs because of that. I've had lots of comments. I'm also really short and small. So the mm. amount of comments that I get because of that too um, is pretty funny. Most of the time athletes are like, you don't feel, you don't look or feel that small when your Impressive. elbow is in my butt. I'm yeah. like, yeah, I know. Um, but I think it's all moving in the right direction. Mm-hmm. Um for sure. There's, uh, there's always going to be something, I've, um, I've, but it is yeah, good. Sorry. I've butchered this story so many times on this podcast. And like, so my research, uh, my bachelor's was on female athletes perception of effective strength and conditioning coaches. So the way I got into that was one of my lecturers, funnily enough, sociology. Um, I hate sociology with a deep burning passion. <laughs> um, but she essentially was like giving us a lecture and she was saying that no research gets done on women like me being stupid and naive i was like bullshit and like i said the set out in class um and fair play to to her she she didn't react she didn't sort of backlash at me she was just maybe she she essentially was like okay this is a challenge i've got for you then go do some research come back to me next week provide me the articles that you find i was like bet let's go came back the next week and i was like look you're right um there's no research on women um like why is that she's like well in research women are seen as half a man or a little man that's one two uh unpredictable a lot of variables that can be messed up with menstrual cycles and anything that hormonally happens with women gets sort of pushed to the side and i was like that's kind of fucked up like like why is that thing that happened she's like it's just because it's too hard so no one wants to do it i was like it's not really how research works in my naive mind right and then i asked her like what what can be done about it and she was like well you've got your dissertation coming up right i was like yeah and she's like well go like, you. um so like from then on like now i'm sort of applying for my master's and writing my research proposals on like the impact that the menstrual cycle has on psychological and physiological output on on training and different parameters to see how effective it is. Like traditional physiology papers will say that there's no difference. But then when you look at the methods, I'm just like, uh, is that yeah. really a measurable test? Absolutely. I think that, well, it's interesting because my big passion is is concussion research, rehab, all that stuff. Um, One of like the big kind of myths out there is that concussion rates are higher in females, which they are, but like one of the big, some of the evidence is more of the, the reason the rates are higher is because the exposure for females is so much lower. So they're exposed Mm. to like contact sports or strength and conditioning or perform any of that so much later on Mm -hmm. that they're probably their tolerance to those impacts, their ability, their strength, their coaching of how to tackle or whatever sport they're doing is so late and so delayed compared to their male counterparts. So it's not so much that, Oh, just because you're female, you're at a higher Mm -hmm. risk. There's so many other pieces that play into that. Um, And so just to kind of throw female athletes into these like bags and and columns or whatever is it just, it's honestly just lazy. And I think the excuse of the menstrual site and all that being super complicated, like it's, it doesn't have to be like, right. And so, and you even see it like here, like we have female athletes, like there's a lot of us, but there's just, there's such, there's minimal you just yeah. need people to care and to invest time 100%. in that. And I think there's a huge push now that female sports in general are the viewership, the mm-hmm. the the money, right? Like is is much greater. Um so yeah, I mean it's it's exciting. It's a really exciting time to see it come together. I'm excited 100%. to see how your dissertation looks. 
so am I. Uh, I really can't <laughs> wait to start it. <laughs> um, I will always say this. I've never said this in the podcast, but I have friends who played women's soccer I like I really like a decent level like they go into the national teams and like they did well for themselves and um, she invited me to to watch one of her games now women are physical like I don't care what you say like if you get cornered you are fucking physical and mm-hmm. I'm here for it so she was running with the ball and she gets like side tackled she does a flip like she flips lands on her back gets up straight away without missing a beat and just continues i'm just like fuck mm-hmm. if that was a man in soccer he'd be down fucking whinging i was like right <laughs> I'm, I'm just like i got so much respect for football now well soccer women's soccer because it's just like they just get up and just go oh yeah love it i'm also interested with concussions in females specifically in combat sports does that What's the correlation between that and obviously because there's not as many female athletes in combat sports, they essentially have to resort to sparring or, or training with men. How how does that change that uh, concussion rate? Oh, gosh, what a great question. Um, we don't have an answer. A concussion in general, in one, one research in combat sports is really minimal. The epidemiological data out there is really sparse. Um, And we were recently just looking at this and it's just not a whole lot. And that's something that the UFC is really pushing is to build out some really high quality epidemiological data. Mm -hmm. Now, the hard part is, is tracking, right? So like the way that our, our system is set up is athletes can use the PI any UFC contracted athlete can use the PI resources as much as they want. It's all for free for them. So they can use this as much as they want, or they can use this as little as they want, right? It's not like a team sport where Mm -hmm. there's a little more accountability and eyes on athletes because everything is really kind of scheduled out here. It's a free for all. So the biggest issue is I can't even give you an answer because we don't have a Mm -hmm. good idea of how many concussions are actually occurring. And I like when the moment I got here, um, that was one of the things I started to try and tease out. So every athlete I work with now, almost always, I'm just like, Hey, what's like, what's your thoughts on concussion? Like, why? Like, Mm -hmm. don't people talk about it or say anything? They're afraid of it, you know? And the, it comes down to ego. It comes down to just like, I can't admit that I got knocked like that by somebody Mm -hmm. and I won't ever admit it. I will never admit it to anybody. Um, so that's why I won't come and disclose. So that's really common. So that's like a cultural thing. So it literally starts with just education. So I, I can't tell you, like we, we've come out with some incidence data, like a 15% like rate of concussion in our athletes in training and, um, in like in actual fights, but it's really, it's not true. Like, it's just not truly indicative of what's going on because we just don't know because yeah. athletes won't come to us, right? Like if we can't get the data to begin with, then like there's not then everything that we do treatment concussion wise like doesn't really matter if we're not getting athletes in the door to come see us for that. Um which is challenging because I came from so the one main reason I went to Duke for residency was they have a really incredible concussion program mm-hmm. out there. And so from the start I was treating athletes for concussion. Uh, because we had a, a funnel system to bring them in. And most of them were coming from team sports where you're having an athletic trainer on the sideline watching practices and can catch those things versus here, like we're treating all day. I can't watch a sparring session every time, you know? So one, it's, it's, we got to get athletes in the door. We got to get them educated enough to feel comfortable disclosing things when they happen. And I think to the other issue, which I had a, an, across the board is just understanding what a concussion is Mm. and what it feels like. Um, And I don't know if you've had concussions in the past, I've had several concussions in the past, which is kind of why, you know, just like with anything, right. You had an injury, you got PT. Mm. That's why I'm a PT. This is why I'm really passionate about concussion. And what I hear a lot is athletes saying, I didn't have a headache, so it wasn't a concussion. Yep. And so, right. Like it's, 
hard to change that narrative unless you're constantly educating those athletes, right? Like I'm sure in teams you, you sit down and you go through it at the start of the season, but like nobody's actually paying attention and being aware or, or gives a shit. Like it doesn't really matter, but starting with like, that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. You yeah. don't have to lose consciousness to have a concussion. Actually athletes who lose consciousness tend to uh, recover a, a little more quickly than those who don't. Okay. Yeah. So that's kind of what the individuals who um, individuals who do have a headache or do have dizziness, they tend to have longer prolonged symptoms, mm -hmm. um, but you don't have to have a headache to have a yep. concussion. Right. And I think what's super unique and challenging about MMA and, and even now it just gets me thinking in general about concussions is if I'm pulling a guy off the field, like football fields, and evaluating them, and I'm testing their memory, I'm testing um, their vestibular ocular motor function and all this stuff, but it's the fourth quarter, and they've played almost every snap, you know, like in the high school, right, they're playing both sides, like if they're fatigued out, they're dehydrated, whatever, and now I'm trying to do a full yeah. neurocognitive assessment on them, is that really accurate? The best thing, yeah, profile, yeah, yeah. Right? And so, especially like on a sideline like that, I got to make a quick decision, right? Like, okay, I can give them a couple seconds to like calm down, give them a breather. Then I got to make a decision, right? Coach has to know right now. Yeah. Is that truly accurate, right? Versus maybe in other sports, like you have more time and you can get them in a quiet environment. You know, they're taking a second, they've ate, they're drank, all that good stuff. But like for these guys, if they just come out of a sparring session or they just finished a fight and they just got whacked in the head, multiple times right if they just lost right the uh, the emotional high the adrenaline dump they get after mm -hmm. am i truly gonna get an accurate concussion assessment afterward or honest as well i don't right yeah i mean okay my head hurts right here well i just got hit i got punched in the face right here and i have a laceration like is that really a headache mm -hmm. i don't know are you fatigued because you had a really crappy weight cut and now we just fought maybe um so i think just kind of getting a broader perspective of everything is not black and white mm -hmm. i think in some settings it can be really easy like that was the beauty of being in that concussion clinic like we worked really closely with other physicians athletic trainers to kind of funnel that in so that i was treating athletes like we knew we're dealing with prolonged concussion symptoms versus in this setting it's like well i had a tough wrestling like i got kind of slammed on the mat during practice and I feel crappy. It's like, well, I always kind of feel crappy and I'm in the middle of cutting. Mm. I haven't eaten that much. I'm cranky. I'm emotional. I'm getting stressed about the fight. Like it's really, really hard to tease out those things. Um, so I'm just learning to kind of take a step back versus like, oh yeah. When I first got here, I was like, yep, that person has a concussion. Yep. That person. And they're like, mm, okay, the next day they actually are fine. They just yeah. kind of had a rough session free. or they, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so it's definitely like very much humbled my concussion side mm -hmm. of things and maybe really rethink how to kind of go about this. And, you know, I've been here, I have, I've been here for seven months now. So I'm still, we're still coming up with a plan of how to get, that's like the long term goal. Like, I do want yeah. us to become like a concussion center for people mm -hmm. to come to, but like, I there's think a, lot, a lot of work to get through. That's the best sort of industry because you'll see so many athletes getting either knocked, rocked, or, some type of impact or blow to the head that you're bound to have more than your usual sport mm -hmm. um on on the back of that i've got two questions how hard is it because obviously in the ufc or mixed martial arts you essentially only get paid for fighting oh like there's sponsorships there's there, there is that whole system but with that have you noticed the an unwillingness to come forward with any type of injuries or concussions in fear that they get pulled from that card or that event that they're supposed to be fighting in? Absolutely. I mean, and that happens with any kind of injury. Mm -hmm. um, but what the, the, the sports medicine side on our end is separate from UFC medical. Ah, so, okay. yes. Yeah, so all of our notes, all of our injury, like a lot of our injury data, all of our notes from treatment sessions and everything is confidential. So UFC right. medical doesn't see that. So oftentimes, like we are treating athletes with injuries two weeks before a fight, but it's like, oh, this is very manageable. We're just going to clean some of this up. 
we're going to manage the pain, but you're still fighting. Okay. Maybe we're modifying, like we, we've been dealing with a lot of rib injuries. So like, okay, you can still pretty much do everything you need to do in training. We're just going to pad you up. Let's try and avoid getting Mm -hmm. hit there for the next two weeks up until your fight. And then you got to go. I mean, that is a huge, huge thing that we keep in mind where, I mean, these athletes like this fight is going to dictate if they can pay rent, support their family, you know, unless you're in the upper echelon of fighters, right. Where it's not a big deal either way, but these athletes, or let's say they have a two fight contract and then they just got in this second fight is a big deal because this is a make or break. They could just get cut right after that. So we luckily, we get a little more wiggle room on our end to try and manage a lot of things um, without like fearing that they can get cut or pulled from medical. Now, if there's like big issues coming up where it's like, I mean, we had an athlete come in recently who had a severe cervical radiculopathy where they couldn't even sit up straight. They literally were just leaned over. They were losing grip in their hand they couldn't even hold a toothbrush right and they're three weeks out from a fight like now he's okay right like we're we're gonna be real with you like yes there are inherent dangers and risk to being an mma fighter and fighting but there's a difference between risking your just daily life and your livelihood and risk it you know if if you can fight if you can do what you need to do in a fight we're gonna get you there as best as we can but yeah. if you can't even hold a toothbrush, how are you supposed to punch somebody, yeah. hold on, protect yourself? If you can't protect yourself, then, you know, that's not safe for that's you or fight. your opponent yeah. either, right? Yeah. So it's a it's an interesting balance and it, it's, a, it's an interesting setup and it's been very unique here versus like in that collegiate setting. There's, there's other things you have to keep in mind where it's like, oh, well, if it's their last season, it's the last game of the year and they're a senior, okay, are we going to just take this up and do what we have to do to get you out there to do it versus like, all right, you're a freshman. Why would we risk this? Yeah. You're probably going to get recruited to the pros. Like, what are we doing here? Um, Mm. Similar, but just like a little different stakes for sure. Can you take us through some of the current protocols and sort of any tests or batteries that you kind of have to identify these and how that process looks? Yeah. So a lot of so if we have an athlete let's say we have uh, an athlete come in complaining of headache they feel off all this stuff so upon initial evaluation really it's heavy subjective super heavy Mm -hmm. subjective of what exactly happened how did you feel the moment it happened what are your symptoms now have you had a concussion before um what are your aggravating factors? What are your easing factors? Like I take an extensive amount of time on my subjective because honestly, that gives me almost more information than what I'm going to get from anything else because my immediate treatment is going to be based on what they tell me. So, um, so like college athlete, like let's take like, we had a college basketball player coming in saying like, I can't focus on the ball. I'm getting a headache. Mm she had ran and she had rammed into another athlete and she had like, they had collided. She don't know. She doesn't know if she hit her head on the ground or hit her head on the other player. Um, but she was able to keep playing. Cause at the time she was like, yeah, my head hurts. Cause that's where I kind of got hit. I felt a little dizzy for a second, but then I got up and I was like, fine. Like, okay. Mm-hmm. She kept playing. Right. Which we know if you have a concussion and you return back to play immediately, your risk of having prolonged symptoms, which for adults is greater than 10, seven to 10 days, having symptoms lasting longer mm. than that. Or for kids, it's greater than 14, uh, greater than two months. So kids are definitely, kids and adolescents are a little different, but ultimately yeah. for a concussion, your symptoms should resolve within seven to 10 days. And that's how most go. Most of them do go. Um, now I can go down a whole nother rabbit hole about this, which we can come back to later about lower extremity injury and concussion and that return to play. But for the I'll sake of this, down. yeah, yeah. Um, so for the sake of this, right. So like she's coming to me, she's saying she can't focus on the ball. She is having a hard time reading in class. Like that aggravates her symptoms so much. And she has a heart, like when she looks at the projector, it makes her symptoms worse. Mm. Right. So she's had a concussion in the past, but, um, she, her easing symptoms are closing her eyes. If she lays down 
and closes her eyes, she feels a lot better. Or if she just stops reading, she can feel better. So for me, like that already tells me a lot, right? Like we probably have some vestibular ocular thing going on, right? If reading, focusing, things like that. But really, ultimately what I'm going to tell her is, all right, I want you to read, but I only want you to read to the point where you get a little symptomatic Mm. and then take a break, right? If you start getting symptomatic in your daily life, right? You need to step out and take a break. Let's write a note to your professor, whatever that is. So the way I explain it to athletes or anybody is when you wake up, because most people feel best in the morning, right? When they wake up, some people don't, which this wouldn't work, but you, you check in with yourself when you feel the best. And you say, all right, on a scale of zero to 10, where am I at? They say, okay, when I wake up, I'm at a zero. I feel absolutely fine. I'm like, great. Now go through your day. As you go through your day, if you ever get up to a two or a three with anything that you're doing, take a break. What makes you feel good? Okay, closing your eyes, putting on some meditation music, that makes you feel better? Great. Let's get you back down to a zero or a one. Then you keep going. So it's so much activity modification to have them get through that day. Yeah, so you're essentially saying that you go through like a, an RPE and then you essentially mm-hmm. do like reps of getting back to that zone, relax, rest, and then go back again. And then again, mm-hmm. I'm guessing that there'll be like a sort of progressive overload to this. Yeah. So that's exactly what it is. And that's exactly how I explain it to my athletes because they understand muscles a lot better than the Mm. brain. It's just like, it's just like lifting weights, right? Like you have to push it to fatigue, get a little micro, put whatever, right. To signal to your brain that we need to build up here. It's the same thing for your brain in order for you to get better with whatever exercises or activities we're doing. We, we have to push into symptoms a little bit Mm. to know like, okay, that's the max. Now we can step back. The problem is athletes don't listen and they will overdo everything and they will push themselves to a 10 out of 10 feel like shit. Mm-hmm. And then they're out of commission for two days because then they wake up the next day and instead of feeling like a zero out of 10, they're feeling like an eight out of 10 and then they can't even start their day going. So honestly, like when I, especially when I talk to PT students, cause I've given a couple of guest lectures on how concussion evaluation and management is like, if you The best thing you can do is just talk to them and give Mm. them that kind of guidance. And that comes into like when I start transitioning them into the weight room, which can happen quite early. It actually, that happens quite early compared to getting back to academics because academics is so hard cognitively Mm. that athletes will return to more sport-like things like running and getting in the weight room before the academics. And Academics don't like that. <laughs> they, yeah. they can't comprehend, like, why are they running, but, but they can't go to learn. class right now, right? And, like, to that, like, the other thing that I always have athletes start doing the first day I meet them is start walking. Start some type mm. of aerobic activity, right? We know that speeds recovery, aerobic activity. Now, I usually – I will use the Buffalo treadmill or the Buffalo bike test to assess that. I usually don't get that done on the first evaluation. Can you explain what that is? Yeah. So the Buffalo treadmill test, which was developed by Dr. John Letty, is a test to assess for exercise tolerance. So Mm. a lot of the times post-concussion, people do not tolerate exercise, usually due to a disruption to the autonomic system. And so it is a progressive exercise test where on the treadmill, you're walking at one speed and you're progressively increasing your incline or on the bike, you're increasing watts and resistance. Um, But you are monitoring heart rate, you're monitoring symptoms, and you're monitoring their RPE throughout this progressive stage. So for the treadmill, every minute you're changing the incline and you're checking in How are you feeling? So you use that visual analog scale, zero to 10. Um, And then there's criteria to stop the test. So usually if they get like three points increase on their VAS, so they go from no headache to three out of 10 headache, or let's say they go from a one on a headache, but now they're dizzy and they feel fatigued, that would be three points. So there, and you can easily, I can always send you the link, but you could Google Buffalo treadmill test. And there's a beautiful like instruction, everything on it, reasons to stop the test, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Um, But usually what we're looking for is they have a significant increase in symptoms. So they don't tolerate exercise because it's making them feel worse. 
Um, their heart rate takes a long time to recover afterward. Um, that I've seen quite a lot. So your autonomic system is for some reason not regulating. And you can do this as soon as two days after their initial injury. Mm. So like they shouldn't be deconditioned like that. Yep. Uh, same thing with their RPE. If it's really like it's gone sky high and they're only on level five out of 20, you know, like that's not mm. tolerating exercise. And then actually what we've seen quite often is a as they're going right like with an increase in intensity and exercise you should have an increase in heart rate to follow that to maintain that right we know that there's a plateau based on stroke volume and your conditioning and uh, the strength of your heart and all that but what i've seen quite often is halfway through their test they get a drop in heart rate like a significant drop in heart rate. they right. go from like 120 130 to 80 and they stay there for two levels or so and then it comes back up and they're fine so during that drops oftentimes athletes will say they either feel worse which kind of Mm. makes sense right your heart's not keeping up or they feel better their symptoms will actually decrease so will that be like going like a a normal state is that when you you, perhaps feel better no i i could not tell you i could not tell you why they feel better when they're coming back down because it's just a dysregulation of that Mm -hmm. autonomic system like your body is not responding to stress in an appropriate way and so based on that test you'll take 80 percent of their symptom their like max symptomatic heart rate so let's say they hit like their four out of ten headache at level whatever and their heart rate's at like 160 you take 80 percent of that and then that's what they train at Mm -hmm. so yeah so, it, I mean, and there's been a lot of studies to show that that early aerobic training is super, super beneficial. And I always encourage clinicians that even if an athlete is symptomatic, as long as they're not severely symptomatic, right? Like they can't even tolerate like just being around people, right? Like mm. that's different. But even if they're slightly symptomatic, doing this test is so valuable because training at that 80% symptomatic heart rate speeds up recovery so well. Yeah, would you um, compare that to like early mobilization for any type of joint or muscular pain? Yeah, I mean, that would be a, a great comparison, right? Like different mechanisms for sure. Um, ideally, right, we're addressing the symptomatic heart rate. We're, we're trying to re-regulate cerebral blood flow. There's mm. a lot of conflicting data on, oh, there's an increase in blood flow. Oh, actually, there's a decrease. We kind of see both. But it's a way to get that cerebral blood flow kind of back, those bare reflexes to be responding appropriately again. One, it gets athletes just excited to be doing something, mm-hmm. um, which plays a huge factor, right? We know that athletes who have a history of depression or anxiety also have a risk of prolonged symptoms, right? So if we can try and mitigate that with getting them doing something is huge as well and definitely speeds up recovery. So I'm huge proponent, even because when I say I don't have time, usually the first day to do that test, Mm -hmm. I'll just say, go on a walk, go walk for five minutes. As long as the sun doesn't bother you. Right. But I always remind people, okay, only walk for five minutes. That means like two and a half minutes back out. And then you have to come back because athletes will walk for mm-hmm. 20 minutes and feel and great and then they hit 20 minutes and then they're stuck and literally i've had athletes call me to come pick them up because they're stuck somewhere because they feel really bad mm-hmm. and they can't walk all the way back right so it's those little things like that early education and management is so vital and you don't have to be a super specialized concussion therapist or person to like give some of that helpful like guidance yeah. out initially you know yeah what's your take on the the whole sleep in while you're concussed um topic yeah oh like getting in a dark room and no, like sleeping so or not sleeping straight after you get concussed falling asleep mm. oh yeah i mean I'm always about you guys can sleep. Now, if I'm worried about like a brain bleed or something, which is fairly unlikely, right? You're probably going to get some other symptoms Mm -hmm. along with that before they pass out. But I sleep is huge. I mean, your brain needs to recover Mm -hmm. and sleep is an optimal time to do that, right? Like if we're saying that like cognitive work is going to prolong Mm -hmm. your concussion, if you're pushing into symptoms, it would make sense to sleep. 
right? Yeah. Like that. Now what I do encourage and I, and I'm okay if athletes take naps because mm-hmm. a lot of the times they'll get this extreme fatigue and they just can't make it through the day without taking naps. I'm like, that's fine. As long as you're limiting them to like 20, 30 minutes, because if you do those two, three hours, it's going to fuck up your sleep that night and you're not going to be able to get good sleep. So sleep hygiene in that mm-hmm. early phase is so, so important. Uh, yeah. So I to- always tell yeah. them to sleep. You're, you're going to love this story. Um, so I play, I played rugby, um, and it was at a time where concussions weren't really a thing, we'll say. Um, so the way our my rugby season worked is I would play for the high school, and then on the Sunday I'd play for the local team. So Saturday game, Sunday game. I would get concussed on the Saturday, play on, and then play the Sunday, and then school the whole week, play again, concussed at some point, and then just keep going. Um, there was once where a guy stuck his arm out and just like clotheslined me. Oh. I went home, I got taken home by a teacher um, saying, hey, your kid's concussed, look after him, goodbye. <laughs> um, and then my mom and sister like were so vigilant of me not falling asleep in case I died, I suppose, that I was just like, dude, it's, I'm just tired. I'm like, I'm fine. Um, but that's what kind of brought on that conversation because th- there's a... a it was a big myth for a while where if you fell asleep after getting concussed, like that's a big no, no. So I kind of want you to debunk that a little bit. Oh yeah. No, huge. No, no. I mean, it originally, it was for the few cases where people would get delayed, like brain Mm. bleeds. And so, you know, you could only mitigate that so much, but again, like I said, they will give you other signs before they just, pass out right and Mm. usually you're gonna get like numbness and tingling down the both arms both legs they're gonna get groggy and agitated they're gonna have slurred speech they're gonna be really off they could get really irritable now irritability is also a symptom of concussion but they're just gonna be far more off like those are the red flag like they get really blurry vision they can't see very well all of a sudden like yes blurry vision is could be a symptom of concussion, but it's to like an extreme extent and comes on kind of all of a sudden. So those are the red flags that we look for. Mm-hmm. Now, if before they go to bed, you check in with them and like, yeah, like I feel off, I feel foggy. Like people just don't feel right after a concussion. And it's really hard to verbalize what that is, right? But if you have an appropriate a medical provider assess them and assess those things, you'll catch any big red flags, right? Like a, a lot of the times I'll get parents will ask me, should I go get, should we go get an MRI? Should we go get a CT? Like, do we need to get this like right now? And I'm like, no, concussion is a structural injury or sorry, Concussion is a functional injury, not a structural injury. So all of your imaging is going to be negative. Mm. Now, if they're getting complete numbness in their arm and all of a sudden they can't walk, right? Like, no, like that's obviously much different, but the likelihood of that is so low. And we, at our high school, we would give out handouts, um, pamphlets and QR codes that they would scan that would Mm. have all of the red flag symptoms on there. Like, these are the things you should look out for. If these things happen, then yes, you should go to the emergency room. But being fatigued and wanting to sleep is not one of them. Yeah. It's just not. They will wake up vomiting, and that's a red flag. They're usually not just pass. Like, if they're sitting at dinner and eating with you that same night, and they pass out, that's different, right? That's not sleep. Mm. That's them passing out, and we need to go get them checked on. Um, so we really try and educate our athletes and our patients of those things and try not to scare them because ultimately we do get those questions about imaging and it's like, Hey, you know, I don't get into the nitty gritty of the physiology, but you know, our imaging, we have no blood tests, right? We know the saliva tests are slowly Mm -hmm. kind of maybe coming around, but, um, we're not going to see anything on imaging. The only time I order imaging is usually in collaboration with a physician. And most of the time it's an athlete who's had symptoms for a really long time and they just need peace of mind that there's not something else going on in there. Um, So that I, 
absolutely debunk the sleeping. Yeah. Sleeping is okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, to a point that you were sort of briefly mentioned before, the lower extremities and concussions. Yes. So this is like a big passion project of mine. Uh, a group of us actually just presented on this at our combined sections meeting, which is our big physical therapy, like our national physical therapy conference back in February. And so really there's so much injury data out there that shows this increased risk of concussion after a lower extremity injury and the increased risk of lower extremity injury after concussion. Like there's so mm. much of this data of higher ACL tears if you've had a concussion in the past and vice versa. And so the question is like, okay, correlation, causation, like what are we truly looking at? And ultimately what we find are these long-term neurocognitive and neuromuscular control deficits after concussion that last up to a year following injury, right? And we know we're clearing athletes, right? Seven days, that normal stage mm -hmm. return to play. But they're actually seeing continued deficits in dual task ability, changes in gait when they're doing dual tasks. So it's like when you do a tandem walk and when you add some other cognitive load or motor task to that, there are changes in their gait, like increased mm. sway, poor balance, poor postural control, um, changes in velocity, like gait velocity, uh, following concussion that are lasting far past when s they become symptom free. And so there's a lot of different theories behind like why this is happening. Um, and we can get, there's like a lot of nitty gritty stuff into that. But mm -hmm. ultimately the thing here is that we are letting athletes return to play without truly assessing if they've returned to that appropriate neurocognitive level and skill that they need. Because if you are not able to multitask, if you are not able to maintain attention on what you're doing, getting rid of unwanted information, be able to think and plan and see the athlete in front of you, who is on your team, who is not, and then see mm. in your periphery of balls, right? Like you, th when you think through all the things that an athlete has to do, all of that is neurocognitive skill, attentional control, reaction time, dual tasking, working memory. And then you have them do a motor task at the same time. Mm. No wonder these athletes are having a risk of injury yeah. and increased injury risk, right? Have you ever looked into SOMA technology? Uh, sorry, which technology? SOMA. So um. we, um, there's been a big, uh, there's a lot of, Okay. Why does this look familiar? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I don't think I've seen this before. So uh, I've kind of been looking into it from a cognitive standpoint, and it's kind of mentioning what you are, where it's like that cognitive load and then physical load come in combined. Um, and I spoke to Peter, who's a more sports um, S and C coach now. With more sports, specifically car, there's so much happening in your per peripheral and there's people talking to you in your ears. There's there's things happening in front of you that you kind of have to be sharp cognitively, specifically with like these 24 hour races where you're like constantly on the go. So he's he's introduced so much technology into his coaching because it sort of targets that. That led me to speak to the CEO of Soma and he's they're, they're trying to get some studies on concussion protocols and how they can bear it because like the SCAT 5 or whatever it's called, like, can you mm -hmm. remember your cat's name? Like, I think there's, there's athletes so, that do the okay. best. Like, they, they can't remember what they had for breakfast this morning, let alone mm -hmm. something from, from different. Yeah. So, and these are my thoughts and feelings. Well, they came out with the SCAT 6 which now adds a dual task gate assessment on there, uh, which I love, right? It's something, but keeping in mind, like the SCAT five is only valid and reliable up to 72 hours after an injury. So like to be using that as like baseline data to then look back at later on, there's really no evidence that baseline data, even with like an impact or a C3 logic, like using baseline data doesn't truly influence clinical decision-making because I think of like, if I do an impact 
right? Okay, they've hit all of these things except one. Am I going to not return them to mm. play because of that one thing? And is that truly indicative of, in this context, their ability to dual task and multitask on the field? I'm not really sure. Um, the only thing that has been shown to be the most re- like valid and reliable baseline test thus far is symptom scores, right? It's so subjective, but it's those symptom scores because almost nobody is at all zeros. If you've ever mm-hmm. looked at that, those 22 symptoms, I have probably like 10 of them on a daily, right? <laughs> but yeah. that's great because if I'm looking at an athlete post-concussion and they're hitting way more than their baseline, or they look kind of just like their baseline, right? Mm. That tells me a lot more than it's like, oh, now all of a sudden we're having some sleeping issues where before you just kind of were fatigued and like had a neck pain that you're dealing with every once in a while. So there's not a whole lot of great baseline testing that Mm. we can use, but diving into more of that neurocognitive skill stuff, we can really assess that afterward. And you don't necessarily need baseline testing for that. There are some normative values for reaction time and stuff um, for that. So we, we here, we use C3 logics, which I do really like because there's really, there, there's some good, they, it's not just, they do simple reaction time and choice reaction time, which I really like. Um, but I'm trying to get us into something more functional, you know, Mm. not everything needs to be functional, but there's actually like for hop testing, there's actually a reactive kind of decision-making version of that where you use blaze pods, light fit, whatever, where athletes have to react and do their single leg hop test based on a color that pops up. And so you can track reaction time and then you compare that not only like their control, like do they look like Mm. shit compared to when they don't have to react or their distance, right? Like we've seen, um, some of my colleagues have done some good research on this. Like they've seen a a pretty significant decrease in single leg hop distance when they add that dual task reactive component. Right. And I don't necessarily need a baseline to make that determination. Right. Like I'm just meeting the athlete where they at, where they're at, whether or not they've had a concussion or not okay, if your dual tasking ability is not good, we know that that increases Mm. your risk for injury, um, whether that's concussion or lower extremity or anything. Um, Yeah. So from a technical point, are you looking at like, are you comparing techniques from before and after to then analyze where if they've gotten worse or better? Yeah. So for a test like that, I mean, ideally, right, you have a motion capture lab and you can really get knee flexion angles and moments Mm. arms and things like that. But I think like we should give our eye a little more credit and using just video analysis in general. So Mm. I love videotaping. So I will video my athletes in every angle, right? So not only am I looking at distance, like the difference between that single leg hop distance um, at its face value, I'm looking at those videos. Like, do they have a stiffer knee upon landing? Are they having poor postural stability and they have a huge trunk lean dynamic knee valgus, whatever that may be, like a huge foot collapse based on the other side? Do they take more trials mm. from either comparing side to side or when they have to add that reactive component? And then you can also kind of get a reaction time. Maybe they have a different side to side um, or you can have like, you can build out like normative data. I don't, I don't know off the top of my head if there's specific normative data for that test in particular, because it's a little newer. Um, but those are the things, because, you know, we can put numbers to everything, but like you have to clinically re- reason through that. Because if their mechanics looked crappy on the first test without mm-hmm. the dual task and they look equally as bad, then like, okay, what mean? great. Yeah. What does it mean? It doesn't mean anything. I mean, in that, you know, that we can go down the whole spiel of objective testing and mm-hmm. all that stuff and how I feel about all that. But um, yeah. even like the data science piece of everything, it, it's, you can get lost in the weeds for sure. hundred percent. And because of like, like you said many times now, there's the, the research is so varied and there's not a lot of it as well. There's like, what does it actually mean? And what are the actual like protocols to follow? Is that something that you're, 
constantly facing? Always. I think, and, and maybe as strength and conditioning has like moved, but I, in this direction too, I'm not sure. But for physical therapy, we went from making return to play decisions with uh, purely based on time, mm -hmm. purely just based on what we thought were biological healing times when we thought people were ready. Um, and then we have completely swung the other way to objective testing. And we kind of lost the art and the clinical reasoning and decision-making that balances those, not even the timeline, just making a, an, a reasonable decision for an athlete, not purely just based on numbers. And I think about this with like a lot of like the, the sports science data I've seen, like all this catapult data, this fatigue data that, you know, they're, they're, jumps are looking bad on the force plates today. Like we need to change their entire mm -hmm. training system up and blah, blah, blah. But when you just go and ask the athlete, they're like, yeah, I just broke up with my girlfriend last night and I didn't eat anything. And I'm just really bummed. And you're like, okay, yeah. that's more information. Right? So when I look at how do we tackle all that information, it really comes back down to reminding myself, who am I dealing with? Like, who is yeah. my athlete? What are we working with? Right? Like I, I've cleared athletes who still have a 22% quad strength deficit, like their peak core, peak torque quad strength deficit. They have a 22%, right? That's like, a, Oh my God, how could, how could we let them go? They're definitely not safe. Well, their peak torque to body weight ratio is 130% on their uninvolved side and 110% on their involved side, you know, or like if, and they functionally look good and they're confident. They have done everything that I've asked. We've slowly progressed them. It was a basketball player. We did one-on-one -on -one half court, two-on-two -two half court. Okay, now we progress to full, you know, like if you're mm -hmm. taking them through all that, you have to trust that like, yes, the numbers help, but it's not the whole story. And yeah, I it's taking that individual get, approach. Yeah. And especially in a team sport where you're dealing with so many people, it becomes mm -hmm. very easy to get lost in that. Um, and here, it's not a team sport. It's all individual. We're taking every athlete. You know, we have we have one athlete who is probably almost six months post-op um, MCL uh, reconstruction. Her isokinetic testing, her force frame data, everything looks amazing. Everything mm -hmm. looks great. Her hop testing is garbage on both sides. So at this point, I don't have enough evidence right now, objectively, to keep her mm -hmm. out, right? Like, okay, like, we've worked on her landing mechanics for months now. They're not changing. They're not getting better. Like, I, and I've, like, changed my approach, right? It's always you first. Like, what can yeah. I do better, right? But you get to a point where it's like, all right, she's got to fight soon. She has to. Yeah. Like, just like you said before, right? She's got to make money. Okay, let's slowly progress her back into what she needs. All right, let's start drilling, wrestling. Let's start hitting pat, you know, like you have to meet the athlete where they are. It, it just can't be numbers. Even though numbers are nice and clear and yep. black and white, like it's just not reality. I've I, I read this thing where a coach was talking about like that 10% difference. Is, it, is that 90% good, but you just went for that 10%? And if so, how much does that 10% actually matter? So like a brilliant example is what you've just said is like everything else is perfect, but her jumps are garbage. So how, how important is that jump to her performance? And like, is that something that she's just fundamentally never known how to jump? Like it, depending on how old she is, you're not, you're not changing that. She's jumping how she's jumping. So like you're a hundred percent, right? It's just like that. How important is it to fix? If it's important, we, we have to bite the bill and just keep going. But if she functions everything else without it, let her roll. Right. And if I were to change something that big, and I think this is very unique to MMA, but a lot of athletes too. But like, if I change that, is that going to mess up her performance? Like as a fighter? Like if exactly. there's a huge yeah, yeah. difference in range of motion on one side, well, maybe that is what makes her really good. You have mm -hmm. like... We talk about basketball players with crazy flat feet. Oh, if we fix that, is that going to make them a better basketball player? Probably not, right? Um, so, James. right? Yeah, I mean, and it just comes back to just meeting the athlete where they are. Like, is this – what's the biggest bang for my buck? And is this really what I need to address? And mm -hmm. I'm always constantly questioning myself all the time.
what yeah. what am I doing, right? And why are we doing it? Maybe it's a good why. And as long as I have a why to what I'm doing and I'm just mm-hmm. meeting the athlete where they're at, that's always what I say. So yeah, it's worked okay so far. So Yeah. And I mean, you're at a decent level as well. So, I mean, I wouldn't say that you're doing anything wrong. I kind of wanted to, to ask you a question based on something that you said earlier. In terms of concussions and protocols, how important is the nutrition towards that? Huge. Huge. I think that it's always a missed piece. And luckily here, um, it's so ingrained in how we manage. And so the kind of the way that we are doing things now is we've honestly taken the, the C word out of things. We've taken concussion out of things and been like, hey, you had a tough bout. Mm. And any person with a tough bout right? There's going to be impact to your brain, to your nervous system. This is why you should care, right? It's going to increase risk of injury. You're going to feel off. You could be emotional. Like this could impact your life in general. So we've moved kind of toward this like brain health initiative. Like, yes, it's big and vague, but it's not for us. It's for athletes. Like they need big and vague, right? Mm -hmm. So kind of pushing towards this brain health and a huge piece of that is all of our nutrition education. And so we actually give them an entire like brain health pack on the week of fight week that includes supplementation and just guidance on like, hey, you need to have good sleep hygiene afterward. Here's some melatonin. Here's another supplement that's going to help with your gut because we know there are changes to that gut brain axis after a concussion and your ability to regulate and people will actually get like difficulty digesting food or feeling like indigestion or other things like that um, after an injury because that is part of your autonomic system as well. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge change in the way that your gut can function if you have had a concussion. So we have supplementation and guidance for that. Um, so nutrition is, is huge. And I know it's still like a big growing piece of things. I know like magazine, magnesium, omega threes, all that good stuff. Like we include all of that in kind of this nutrition health, um, handout that we email all of our athletes after their Mm. fight. Um, and then there's another supplement. I can't remember off the top of my head that is ideally for brain health after and like brain recovery. Um, and also like managing your carbohydrates after, like there is a big energy discrepancy following concussion, um, because you have all of your axons pretty much go under this tensile force, all of your sodium potassium channels open at once. And it's like an electrical storm that happens. So there is a lot of energy and ATP Mm. that needs to be utilized to reset those sodium potassium ion channels. But then you also have changes in cerebral blood flow that are occurring so that you need a lot of energy, but you're not getting that energy. Plus you have changes in your gut. That's not getting you that energy as well. So you have this huge imbalance going on. Um, And nutrition is a huge piece. And I think that honestly we do our nutrition, our dietitians and nutrition team do such an incredible job of, um, implementing that for our athletes, not even just post fight, mm-hmm. but even kind of like throughout a camp. Especially that makes sense. Session, why session. you recommend going on for that walk then? Because there, there's so much going on that they're having to expand that energy somehow. Obviously, we know running or any high intensity exercise is the worst thing because it'll just worsen the symptoms. So that that clicks as well. That's mm-hmm. pretty cool, actually. Yeah. So what kind of supplements is it that you that you recommend for like what kind of I know that the UFC has like very strict guidelines on supplementations and anything that goes into the athletes bodies mm-hmm. what is it that you recommend for like melatonin um magnesium yeah. like what, what what do you recommend Let me pull up our handout mm. Let me find it really quick because it gives yeah, us kind of everything that we need. The beauty of having an interdisciplinary team, there's a bunch of stuff that I don't always have to remember off the top of mm. my head because they do it for me. That's something okay. that Becky touched on was that like right. how well connected you are with each other and how good the communication is. Yeah, I mean, and that's a huge part. And I think honestly, a lot of that 
you know, when people ask me like, oh, how did you get this job? You know, what, what did you do to get you to where you are now? What kind of experiences do I need and resume building crap, Mm -hmm. you know? And a lot of it, I come back to like, yes, everything that I did led me up to like getting selected for an interview, but it ultimately comes down to personality. Am I going to fit in with the people and that system? Or am I going to come in and like wreak havoc because I just don't fit in with the culture or the people? And it's all about fit. And you can tell when one person is off, the whole thing falls Mm. apart. And so for me, like, I like everybody that I work with. Like, that's huge. Like, I want to come into work, right? And it's, you know, there are studies that have come out that said the reason people stay at their job, even if they don't necessarily like their job, is because they like their boss and the people that they work with. And that's what it is about, you know? Anyway, so on that, uh, so like we recommend, um, here, I'm probably can. So we recommend Um, Mm omega-3s. Afterward, we we recommend about about 300 milligrams of omega-3s, definitely early on. Um, And then tapering that down. as you kind of in the later stages, just like whatever, like daily intake that you normally would. Um, and then really monitoring the actual food that you're intaking. So having a good balance between protein, but getting a lot of good like fats in as well, being careful with not doing a lot of high carbohydrates. Cause that like glucose spike can also throw you off with that change in that, uh, gut brain axis. Um, And then we like are good with like recommending melatonin afterward for sure, just to help with um, managing sleep and making sure you're getting a sufficient amount of sleep, Um, especially because a lot of athletes post concussion will have difficulty like staying asleep Mm. um, depending on what's going on. So those are kind of like our general recommendations afterward. Um, And just like a general, like kind of like anti-inflammatory type diet. Uh, because we know even like without a concussion, just like a post fight, like your body is trying to heal and it's in a high inflammatory state. So if you can manage that as much as you can with your diet, uh, that's the details of that. Again, mm. I'm going to rec- I'm going to hand off to <laughs> a true specialist. Um, but yeah, those are kind of the main things that we look at too, especially and like including like probiotics to help with those gut issues that can happen afterward because of that like dysregulation and your gastrointestinal function and motility and all that what would be some like low hanging fruit straight after a concussion for you like management wise yeah um so right after 24 hours chill get off your phone get off of the tv don't go hang out with people don't drink alcohol um, which is really hard after a fight, especially if you have won. Yep. Um, but that's going to really perpetuate that high inflammatory state. Um, and it's just, it's not helpful for healing in general. So first 24 hours, keep it chill. Um, don't aggravate symptoms. We're not trying to train or push into anything. Mm-hmm. After that 24 hours, go on a walk. Anything, go on a walk. Try not to push into symptoms. Those are the low hanging fruit and then handling that nutrition piece, right? Like that doesn't take a lot of thought or thinking, doesn't require you to go outside or do anything, um, just doing that management there and then not being afraid to reach out to somebody if it's not going right, right? Because in reality, you should be starting a return to play progression after that 24 hours, right? Like you should feel like you could go on a run the next day. You don't feel like that, right? It's kind of different with our, right? Like if, we have like full body other issues going on, right? I get you're not going to run. But if, yeah. you know, you're a basketball Especially player, those cop football player, oh my gosh, that is probably the worst things I've seen are just the shins of mm. these athletes afterward. It's insane. That's okay. the craziest thing by far. They look broken and they're not. And it's insane. That I, I, like, I wish I could speak to you like for multiple episodes because like there's so much that we can dive in, like concussion. Right. Because I knew you, that's the your speciality. Like, I really mm. want to pick your brain on it. But I think there's so much to be said in, like, shin kicks or calf kicks, quad kicks, and then ribs, because that's quite a prevalent thing for, mm-hmm. for, for the UFC, especially when you get those, like, little liver shots. Like, 
what you do then and um I'll, uh, well, I wish we could keep going <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? um what would be like some key pieces of advice that you would give uh, physiotherapists wanting to come into the industry so biggest thing is be humble and open-minded you are especially in sports in general as a physical therapist you walking into an athletic training room or a strength and conditioning room like that's not your space right like that's not like your space yet um, and you have to learn as much as you can so like when i walked into an athletic training room i'm there to be how can I help you to my athletic trainers? What can I do for you? That is the best way. And same thing with strength and conditioning, right? Like I'm here. What can I do for you? Mm -hmm. Picking up plates, putting towels, like those little things matter as a physical therapist, because we aren't exposed to that sports realm. Like a lot of other um, like professions are and just being open-minded that you don't know everything mm -hmm. and everybody has their place in an athlete's recovery rehab, um, performance just in their whole journey of why they're there and just recognizing your gaps and that's the beauty of interdisciplinary just like how becky said like these people are here to fill the gaps in your knowledge i don't have to know everything mm -hmm. i shouldn't know everything because that's just going to be superficial level of knowing everything and that's freaking useless nobody wants that so that's kind of my advice that i would give to physical therapists is take a step back be open-minded learn from everybody and that will help you find your place better and show where your value and your mm -hmm. worth is a lot easier to be able to collaborate as effectively as possible. 100%. One of the first things that I said in my introduction when I coached at the University of Washington was, hi, my name is Manny. I'm 20, whatever I was. And when it came to like what my goals for, for my time there was, I was like, I'm here to make your life easier. And it's just that mentality of just being a sponge, just absorbing everything that you can. I think that's amazing advice. Um, if you want to, um, what's the words I'm looking for? If you want to plug anything, uh, it's very early here. Very early. Uh, I know. I know. I, um, yeah. Impressive. You've made it this far. Pretty good. <laughs> uh, so yeah, if you want to plug anything or just where people could reach you. Yeah, um, I have nothing to plug. Maybe one day I'll have something to plug. Um, but yeah, if you just want to, if you ever want to get in contact with me, probably Instagram is the best way. You can just shoot me a DM at Olive Abdu. Yep, right there. Um, yep. So always, again, like I said before, I pretty much respond to any and all contact. Um, so that'd be the best way to reach me. Perfect. Thank you so much for coming on. And I do appreciate um, the time that you've sort of taken to, to walk me through your protocols and everything that you sort of analyze and look at in a concussion standpoint. Absolutely. Thanks so much. It was such a pleasure, Manny. No, appreciate you. Thank you. Peace. <laughs>